Hi, I'm Mike Duran. I'm the director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at the Hudson Institute. And I'm joined today by my two middle mil, military, it's a hard word to get out, my two military analyst colleagues, that's uh, John Kasapolu and Brian Clark, two of the leading military analysts in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And we're going to talk to them today about the military implications uh, particularly with respect to American strategy of the Gaza war. Uh, John Kasapolu, let, let's start with you. Why don't you just uh, give us a sense of what has been revealed to us uh, uh, in the Gaza war that we didn't know or maybe knew but didn't hadn't uh, taken full appreciation of? Well, thanks, Mike. And it is it is a privilege to be on the same stage with one of the one of the highest regard colleagues, highly decorated colleagues that, that I take in the highest regard. I learn from uh, a lot, uh, Brian Clark. Uh, first of all, Homo sapiens as a biological species is still the most formidable war machine. So it is not only Star Wars, it is, I think, somewhere between Star Wars and the Mad Max, uh, the future of warfare. We see that in, in, in the Middle East. We also see that in the Russo-Ukrainian war. We have drones, we have starting internet, we got everything that is that is Star Wars looking like. But still, trench warfare is there to stay. T-72 tank is there to stay. Uh, RPGs are still dangerous, and their, their modern variants and derivatives are still dominant in the, in the battlefield. So again, like in a nutshell, all the way from Ukraine to the Middle East, Homo sapiens as a biological species, human factor in warfare is there to stay, at least for the 21st century, I would say. Uh, second, uh, failure of imagination and military intent, good old military intelligence is still paramount in, in uh, preventing threats. I mean, let's look at how the joint operation by Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and its armed wing Saraya played out uh, during the October 7 terror plot. Paragliders, amphibious teams, and rocket barrages and, and loitering munition barrages at the same time simultaneously orchestrated by two actors that one would turn easily turn a blind eye to and, and neglect that threat. But the sophistication of the terror plot uh, on the very uh, day of October 7, and we should keep in mind that these actors invaded simply uh, the southern Israeli territory for about like 48 hours. And it took like Israeli security forces about two, three days to clear the territory from the, the hostile infiltration. Uh, you. I mean, like one one shouldn't underestimate the planning and execution capabilities of adversaries, even they look inferior in a force on force ratio uh, calculus. I would say that's the that's the second thing. Over reliance on technology is equally dangerous as lacking the technological prowess. I would say it is the it is the sweet spot, and still you know technology. And all military capabilities are relevant within within a meaningful concepts of operations and, and doctrinal understanding. That's also the fourth lesson that I would take from the Middle East, boiling it down to more tangible and more, uh, more tactical level. I would say that ground forces holding territory, force to terrain ratio as the IDF, Israel Defense Forces operations are, are ca being carried uh, uh, on right now, it is important because it, it the Israeli government and the Israeli military need to hold and control ground to 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 to, uh, to uh, address the threat emanating from Gaza. This is important. I think Israel learned learned it the hard way back in two thousand and six during the Second Lebanon War. Over reliance on air power had a had a, a bitter cost for Israel. Uh, here also we are seeing that the the good old armor, main battle tanks, armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles. They still matter. Uh, can I, can I, superiority. Yeah. Sorry, sure. can I stop you there for a minute? Um, is it possible? Uh, uh, I'm thinking of this as a layman and and as someone. I'm not a military analyst. Uh, and when you put the emphasis on um, controlling um, uh, controlling territory, is it possible to to say that this is, there's also been an over reliance on intelligence? That there's a uh, I would say what, that what, there, there has been over-reliance on the technological aspect of intelligence. 
I mean, let's let's revisit how the operation was done, that the, the terror operation was done by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. These guys must have been drilling that year long because it was so orchestrated. Timing was so important. The tactical segments of the operation was so sophisticated. The yeah. paragliders on the one hand, the amphibious detachments on the other hand, and you have to all synchronize it. I mean, like second by second, minute by minute by the artillery, drone, and rocket barrage, and you have to do it in a blitz fashion to paralyze the Israeli border security and the Israeli defense forces. And that terror plot penetrated all the way into the Gaza division. Um, you cannot anticipate, control, and react to that scale of terror plot by solely relying on technological means in intelligence gathering. Uh, last thing before I, I leave the floor to my colleague Brian Clark, we do not know if the intelligence was there for the Israeli security officials to analyze or the analyzed and processed intelligence was there for the Israeli political decision makers to act upon and, and, and take into consideration. But if this is the case, the good old intelligence theory is still relevant. The best intelligence is nothing if it is not well digested and acted upon by political decision makers. I think the if you want me to summarize in one single sentence or what's happening in the Middle East and drawing parallels to, uh, to, the, uh, to the situation in Ukraine, I would say military tradition, the old school military tradition that we study at military colleges, uh, they still matter. Okay, I'm going to come back to you and ask you a little bit about the other side as well. But uh, let's, uh, let's move on to, to Brian here. Uh, Brian, what are your big takeaways from the war so far? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. And it's great to be here. And it's great to be with John. It's very, great to see you and uh, to work with you. Uh, again, I love collaborating with him. Uh, he's one of our finest analysts and ex expert on this area and, and these areas of operations. Um, I, yeah, a couple of my big takeaways are that, you know, like like John said, it's it doesn't change how uh, warfare is, is waged. You know, really, the human element is still paramount. Uh, and technology has not adjusted the fact that we still have to take ground uh, root people out, you know, in, in the case of Hamas, you have to get a terror network out from a civilian population. So you have to separate the two and extract those leaders. Uh, same challenge that the U.S. faced uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the same challenge that the British faced in Malay. I mean, it's the fundamental challenge that militaries have to encounter when they're trying to address a terrorist group or an insurgent group. You know, it's just you've got to be able to get into the population and be able to separate the the terrorists and the bad actors from the civilians who are who are non-combatants and otherwise not involved. Um, you know, and Israel can use technology probably uh, more effectively than they have. Uh, they tended to rely, as, as, as Chan said, uh, too much on technology to manage the intelligence uh, and be able to protect you know, their territory uh, from uh, Hamas's incursion. But I think yeah, that's a big takeaway is that technology has not changed kind of the fundamentals uh, of warfare. So we, we often talk about it as being you know, the nature of warfare versus the character of warfare. So the nature of warfare is still there, but the character may change. So I think what we see in Ukraine, uh, what we see with Hamas as well, is that technology and its proliferation, its democratization has enabled you know these smaller actors, less capable actors to play with the big boys. You, Ukraine was able to fight off the Russians in large part because they leveraged available technologies and had, you know and had some help, but it was all uh, using new, new technologies to to better position themselves and, and counter the Russian in, in, in onslaught. Hamas, same way, they use technology to level the playing field. But then after that initial victory, it comes down to a lot of kind of fundamentals still. You've got to be able to hold ground, take ground, um, you know, push your adversary off it. Uh, and this is something the U.S. tends to, we tend to forget and try to ignore because it's it's not a, it's a, it's a you know, unpleasant aspect of war. Uh, we want to boil it down to be air power, sea power, long range standoff munitions, technologically uh, based, which is a luxury we have uh, of being, you know, a continent or ocean away. Way on our own continent. Uh, and this is something we would face if we ever got back into a fight, you know, in the Eurasian theater. So I, I think, you know, it's interesting how much things have changed, you know, with the, the advent of technology and how it's uh, altered the character of warfare. But it's interesting how it hasn't really changed the nature of warfare uh, and the fact that it's all about people. And you got to, in this case, separate civilian and, and military populations from one another. But Brian, staying with you, it, it, mm -hmm. what, what do you imagine uh, Secretary Austin, the Secretary of Defense, top guys in the Pentagon right now, um, they weren't they weren't planning 
for Ukraine or or for mm-hmm. or for Gaza, the things that have been eating up most of their time or, you know, a huge percentage right. of their time. They never right. expected to see it here. It, here it is. If, if we had them here and we could give them truth serum and they tell us what are they, what, you know, what are their big takeaways? What do they really think uh, they learned? Um, uh, from these conflicts with respect to America's interests? What, what, what do you think they right. came away with? Well, I think I think they came away with a, the uh, a realization that there's a lot more uh, threats out there than they maybe gave credit to when they first took office. I think there was largely an expectation that we could focus our attention on China and deterring China um, and that we'd be able to leave these other theaters to either tend for themselves like the Middle East or uh, our European allies would take care of themselves. Um, but we've seen is you know, the technological technological proliferation, you know, and, and the leveling of the playing field has allowed Russia to basically get back on the stage as not just a nuclear power, but as a major power able to, you know, wage war against its neighbors. Uh, and even, you know, those that are equipped with Western forces have been able to, uh, you know, haven't been able to, to regain their territory. Um, Iran, you know, has, has once again, you know, been able to rear its head and, and make itself a, a player in the Middle East in a lot of new ways that we had not expected really necessarily. So I think if you gave them true Truth serum, they would say, we did not expect the threats really to manifest from Russia and, and Iran in the same way that they have. And I think they would say, in part, they're happy that North Korea has not also made itself into a uh, a problem for the United States in the same way. But I think that would be their biggest takeaway is that they thought China was going to be the big problem. And it's turned out that um, you know these other actors maybe have less to lose and therefore are more willing to employ these technologies uh, in, their, in service of their national interests. Um, and that's created a lot of challenges for the United States because its allies were not will we're not able to to carry the load entirely by themselves uh, and john, john kasapalu you uh brian just mentioned us the 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 russian and iranian threats really uh rearing their head in the in the consciousness of uh um of the american leadership um, but we're we're also seeing in addition to them rearing their heads we're also seeing increased cooperation um, uh, among them. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that cooperation and the, the aspects of it that are most disturbing to you? Well, the short answer to that question is the red team is on the rise. And the red team is not seeing the world in an isolated fashion that most Western capitals tend to see. Who is who? Who is the red team? So the red team is all the bad guys in the town that you can think of all the way from North Korea uh, to Iran. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese, and we are seeing that there is a close and hostile cooperation between them, and this is systematic. Uh, By systematic, I mean the Western capitals, most NATO capitals, tend to see the world and strategic affairs case by case. So North Korea is North Korea. It It is dealing with North Korea. Iran, it is Iran in a very isolated fashion. You deal with Iran, and it has nothing to do with Russia, and you deal with Russia and China separately. But these actors do not see the world and flashpoints of the world like that. They see the world through the prism of interconnectedness. Let me give you some tangible examples. And also it's going to be eye-opening for for our audience as well. Uh, The the North Korean lifeline within three months to the Russian military is one million artillery shells in the principal 152 millimeter Soviet Russian standard uh, artillery shell class. The Russian production for artillery shells is 2.5 million in a year. So the North Koreans delivered nearly half of the Russian production in the principal artillery rounds within only one quarter of the the year. And this outnumbers the entire artillery transfers in the principal 155 millimeter class coming from European uh, Union nations. So the North Koreans- Hold on, let me, let me, let me repeat that because it's a startling statistic. You just told us that uh, that North Korea is producing more artillery shells for Russia than Western Europe is producing for Ukraine. They have transferred more artillery shells to the Russian military than the West, the entire European Union nations transferred to uh, the Ukrainian military since the outset of the war. So you you changed my verb from produce to transfer, transfer because we don't yeah. know the production levels of the uh, of the of the North Koreans but they certainly have the supply ready to offer to the to, to the Russians. Exactly and this is a very artillery hungry war. And the Russian military operations, the Russian combat operations are very artillery centric. We are talking about like sometimes 25 to 30,000 shells per day. 
fired by the fired by the Russians, and we are seeing direct impact of that. I mean, all the way from Avdiivka to Kherson, we are seeing that the Russian artillery units are picking up where they left off in terms of like unleashing tens of thousands of artillery shells onto the Ukrainian positions. And again, like this is a very artillery centric war. Uh, the Iranian lifeline to the Russian military. The Russian military was never prepared for a long war scenario in Ukraine. It was going to be, in a good day, it was going to be a larger scale replicate of 2014 Crimea. They were prepared. They, 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 they were prepared to take control of the Ukrainian statecraft. I mean, let us all recall what happened at the very, very beginning of the operation when the Ukrainian military and the territorial defense forces resisted. The Russians called for a ceasefire in Belarus. And before the ceasefire talks in Belarus, Vladimir Putin called for a coup in Kyiv. He literally called the Ukrainian armed forces to overthrow President Zelensky. And he said, let us just sit and talk with you. They were never prepared. We call it IPB, the intelligence preparation of the battlefield. The Russian intelligence preparation for the war in Ukraine was a larger scale replication of 2014 hybrid takeover in, in Crimea. Uh, but when things go as not planned, when things went south, the Russians looked for an alternative for long range strikes compared to their expensive uh, munitions like the, like the Iskander missiles and Kaliber cruise missiles. And Iran entered the play at that very moment. One single Iranian loitering munition in the Shahid baseline is about like $20,000 to $30,000. And it is available in very large numbers. The Iranian production line is really immense. And the, what Iranians are doing right now, they are not only giving the Russians what they need for long range strikes, they are also starting a joint drone production plant in the Russian Federation. So that plant going to produce thousands of drones for the Russians in a year. Uh, not only that, the Iranians are also working on improving the Shahid baseline, the loitering munitions that is found in the Ukrainian population centers right now. The Ukrainians are empowering it with a jet engine, with better sensor technology, better control, command control and communications infrastructure. So the beast will be more powerful and, and destructive than it has ever been. And this Iranian lifeline was the very reason that the Russians so, can sustain, so the the Russians, Russians can sustain the, the long-range strikes. The Russians are delivering to the Iranians, if I understood you correctly, they are they are they are uh, they are delivering Russian technology and and subsystems that can be used in Iranian drones to make Iranian drones better. They will deliver those to the Iranians, and so not only will Russia be not only are Iranian drones helping Russia in Ukraine, the experience of cooperation is going to make Iran more powerful in the Middle East. You are right. Uh, or I, I, I have I have even like worse bad news for you. The Iranians are able to harvest combat operation experience from the ongoing war, and it is invaluable to them in bettering their, in mastering and bettering and perfecting their solutions. I mean, they have tested their drones against all air defense systems possible, all the way from Patriot, NASAMS to Soviet Russian uh, air defense systems that the Ukrainians are operating. They tested their drones against every single target from military targets to critical infrastructure. And they tested their drones in extreme weather conditions from freezing cold weather of Ukraine to summer conditions in rainy conditions, all weather conditions in a very complicated battle picture from a defense technological and industrial based standpoint this is invaluable for the Iranian revolutionary guards okay so uh, uh brian i i don't see as far as i can tell um uh, any uh, policy response from the united states uh to the growing cooperation among the russians and the iranians uh, the in accordance with the um, with the UN resolution that endorsed the JCPOA, the restriction on the Iranians uh, for selling uh, missiles uh, is is um, has ended. So th this industrial defense industrial base that the um, Iranians have uh, very ingeniously developed while under massive sanctions um, is set to begin exports. To the rest of the, I mean, their exports are already begun, but there's, they're going to increase 
So they're going to get not, not, not they're going to have a better product coming out of this war, but they're also going to have better sales and more revenue as a, uh, um, uh, uh, as a result. What do you, in, in your contacts with uh, defense officials, are you sensing that this is causing alarm in Washington or are we, is it just ho-hum, nothing to worry about here? So to some degree, it's not causing as much alarm as you'd think. So what you know, you're like, you know, John just talked about, we have this ecosystem developing, you know, where technology and money is flowing between uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. You know, they're they're each providing resources to each other. They're providing military technologies to each other to varying degrees. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's in violation of, you know, trafficking rules, uh, money laundering rules, you know, uh, you know support to uh, terrorist and other activities rules. So there's a lot of regulations that are being flouted by these countries as they start to create this ecosystem. Um, and, on the from the U.S. side, the reason that this is not drawing as much alarm is because it's sort of driving driving towards a form of warfare that we see happening in mi the Middle East and Ukraine right now, which is this, as John talked about, this combination of commercially derived drones and communication systems like Starlink and sensing systems like you know the Maxar and other commercially derived uh, satellite based uh, sensing technologies. Uh, all these commercially derived technologies being combined with the tools of trench warfare, you know, artillery, armored personnel carriers, you know, fighting vehicles. From the U.S. perspective, this is not how we would fight. This is not the U.S. way of war anymore. This is not even the NATO way of war anymore, um, which is partly why the U.S. has not been able to support it nearly as much as people thought it would. Um, so on the U.S. side, it's that we say, well, you know, the fact that these guys are, you know, messing in these technologies and supporting one another is somewhat obviated by the fact that if we had to fight them, we would fight in a completely different way. We would use air power. We'd be using electromagnetic warfare. We'd be using space, offensive space operations. We'd be doing a lot of things differently. We'd be using offensive cyber operations to a great degree. Um, and you know, the U.S. way of war is really at odds with the way that you see these conflicts playing out. So there's less of a there's it's just not driving the the urgency on the part of the U.S. to come up with a policy response because this ends up being a problem for frontline allies or frontline partners even uh, much less than it becomes a problem for NATO and the United oh, States. That's, that's that's that is very very interesting. I was not aware of that. Uh, um, so they have a. The 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 uh, let me repeat back to you what I heard, and you can tell me if I got it right or not. Our uh, American leaders have the nightmare scenario that they're concerned about, or the or the, the number one problem that they're trying to solve at all times, which is I presume conflict with China over Taiwan. They have a vision of what that conflict looks like. This is the mm -hmm. this is the this is the top priority is to prevent that. Um, and if if it, if it fails to be prevented, then to win it, to prevent that conflict, and if we fail to prevent it, then to win it. Um, and there, that is the number one issue on their minds. And when they see these other conflicts, they uh, they they the first kind of thing that they do, it's kind of like when you uh, you know when you come across food and you want to know is it is it good or bad. You first thing you do is smell it. If it smells bad, you just throw it away. They just do a test, and does this. Does does this impact the, any of my planning about the right. thing that I'm concerned about? No, it doesn't. So okay, it's a problem. It's a, it, it's a big political problem. There's a there's some military involvement that we we have to be worried about. It. But this is not a threat to our really right. core interests, as I as I understand it. Do I do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a core. It's not a threat to our main concern, which is how do we prevent a war over Taiwan. It's also not a threat to our NATO allies. You know, our treaty allies would all fight these fights the same way we would fight them, which is, you know, we're going to use air power. We're going to over overwhelm their air defenses. We're going to, you know, try not to get into a, a ground offensive, you know, with uh, static lines with them. We're going to do it entirely differently. So the fact that Ukraine's having to fight this way, or even Israel's having to fight this way, is you. Know, that's kind of their problem, and we're trying to feed them as much support as we can to enable them to fight that better. But if we were to, if, they, if this was something that we had to fight, we would fight it completely differently. We would not either or not get ourselves involved in it. So, so on the U.S. side, that's where you're seeing a less of a sense of urgency about, uh, you know, addressing this ecosystem of defense and you know technology uh, support that these countries are forming. Uh, my as 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 somebody um, um, who is a military who's who's a Middle East expert and not 
a military expert. Uh, I would I would classify myself as somebody who uh, thinks that mil I'm a, I'm a Middle East analyst who thinks that military affairs is the most important thing. So I, I listen to guys like you, but I can't do the kind of analysis you do. I think that what you just described is is a strategic failure that are that strengthening our allies and making sure that our allies win and win decisively is a better or is should be a uh, should be a pillar of our strategy and a great way to prevent us from ever having to go to war with these fantastic systems that we're 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 developing do you agree with that or am i being simplistic yeah. I agree. I think it, the you know the best way to basically keep China, for example, uh, off of off its game is to give it problems with its partners, you know, Russia and Iran primarily. To say, well, can I make Iran's life more difficult by allowing Israel to be more effective in countering Hamas or uh, in allowing Saudi Arabia to better counter the you know Houthis in Yemen, um, or and you know similarly with Ukraine, can I make can I allow you or can I enable Ukraine to win, not just survive, uh, and that you know presses back on Russia, which then redounds back to China. So, you know, if we're focused on China, you got to, you know, the longer game is, uh, you know, engaging its partners, you know, that are providing support in one way or another to China. So that's, I agree with you. I think you have to press them on all fronts. And this is probably the most effective front we have right now, which is these ongoing conflicts with China's proxies or partners. But John Kusapalu, they have, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Iranians um, and their, resistance alliance they have just succeeded in in showing the russians and the chinese how much they can do for them because they have uh, they have forced the united states to devote enormous time uh, uh um, um political capital um, and resources including including military resources to this theater which the American leadership had uh, had uh, downgraded to being of secondary uh, of, of of secondary importance. Uh, don't you find that rather amazing? As somebody who's uh, uh, you're a Turkish citizen and uh, you're part of the you know somewhat uh, Turkey's not really dependent on the United States, but I mean it's it's under the American defense umbrella. Does this make you uneasy when you see American leaders making decisions like this? Well, yes and no. As Brian said, like NATO way and standards of warfare are different. And Turkey is one of the key nations within the NATO alliance for decades. So when it comes to the, the, the Turkish-Iranian military balance, still we are talking about two different paradigms, NATO yeah. paradigm and the, and the Iranian paradigm. And whenever NATO paradigm faces another paradigm, that paradigm tends to be, so far, thank God, inferior uh, to what we have in invented and, and tested again and again uh, over the years. Uh, NATO is a very successful alliance and it has a, a paramount and immense deterrence effect because we we adapt well, we fight well, and despite all our mistakes, we have the best defense technological and industrial base. So in terms of Turkish-Iranian bilateral uh, you know, balance of power and NATO, the NATO frontier here, I'm not that concerned. What I'm concerned is like two things I'm I'm very concerned about. The, the the first thing is we are all talking about the the systems that the Iranians and the North Koreans are transferring to the Russians. But the, the critical intelligence question here is what they are getting in return and mm -hmm. what they're gonna get in return. Because it was 2014, the Russian invasion of Crimea, and up until that point, the, the Russians were not very enthusiastic about giving the Chinese critical systems like SCORE 35s, like the S-400s, I'm sure Brian just followed all the story back then very closely. But the Chinese caught the Russians very vulnerable at the time because of the sanctions and everything. And they were managed to, they, they managed to snatch up uh, their shopping cart as they wished. So right now the Iranians are getting SCORE 35s. This is a super maneuverable uh, air superiority fighter. Do we do we know that for sure? I've seen the the reports from the, the Iranian press saying that they're saying that they are, but I haven't seen a Russian confirmation. We have the telltale indicators, just like you know, bringing the pieces of a puzzle together. So the, we know for sure that the Iranians are getting an aircraft called Yak 100, 130, and this is a trainer jet for the advanced Russian aircraft. 
So you are getting the trainer uh, for Square Thirty Five, okay? And you wouldn't, and 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 is it true that you you probably wouldn't get the trainer unless you were going to get the jet? Exactly. So okay, and because that Yak One Hundred and Thirty, its main mission is to train pilots for superior Russian aircraft like Square Thirty Five. We know that the Iranians are building bases for Square Thirty Five with the mockups of Square Thirty Fives placed there. And these bases, like the old Yugoslavian bases, these are underground facilities. So if you combine an aircraft with kinematic advantages, like Sukhoi 35, with underground bases, that combination would allow you a broader array of military options, especially thinking of the Iranian airspace. For okay. those of us who are not military analysts, tell us what uh, kinematic advantage is. It means that in within within visual warfighting, like good old Top Gun warfighting, that gives gives like movie moves uh, to to the audience. That is that is really exciting. That aircraft is fast. It is very agile, and it can make maneuvers that most mass Western aircraft cannot do. Uh, one can argue that in the 21st century, there is little room for within visual range combat. It is all like beyond visual range capabilities. But there are two caveats for that. One is the Ukrainian airspace. In Ukrainian airspace, we are still seeing dogfights. We are still see yes, there is no F-35, there is no fifth generation aircraft, but one cannot rule that that possibility. Second, any this scenario- goes, This goes back to your opening for the thing about the difference between Star Wars and Mad Max. And Mad we Max. Still, and we still live in a Mad Max world. So an airplane with these advantages can bring significant benefits to a country that's up against Al, uh, uh, some someone other than the United States. Exactly. And second, and I, I also want to hear what Brian thinks about that. It, it, we are turning it into intra-Hudson email correspondence that we are discussing about military affairs in, in long hours. But any military capability is meaningful within a, within a scenario and concepts of operations. So any conflict that involves the Iranian air power will most likely take place in the Iranian airspace. Mm -hmm. Let's be blunt and, and straightforward about that. Iran is not only building those technologies, Iran is building a bomb. Iran is getting nuclear day by day. And it is not a technical impediment right now. It is just a political decision that Iran did not has not introduced military grade nuclear capability to the Middle East. So if Iran introduces that capability, or if Iran, we sense that Iran is on the verge of introducing that capability, there could be an American, Israeli, either unilateral or, or, or joint operation taking place in the Iranian airspace. So Skoi 35s operating within the Iranian airspace, taking off from underground bases, okay, then kinematic advantages might matter because you are entering the Iranian airspace with tens of aircraft, even though they are fifth generation. All right, all right. so you're an F-35, you're an Israeli F-35 entering Iranian airspace to bomb an, an Iranian nuclear facility. Why do you, are, you can't take out the uh, S-35s with ease? I mean, like you can in an air engagement, but not all of them. And it takes the Iranians one or two lucky shots on the Israeli aircraft and a few Israeli captured pilots because a captured pilot is not a casualty. It is not a prisoner of war. It's a political asset. It's a political asset to negotiate. Like the hostages we see in, uh, in, in, in Gaza right now. I mean, like, I do not want to compare human lives with human lives. Every Go single ahead. human life is like, yeah, really, uh, but, okay, uh, okay, but, fine. And, but but you know, mm -hmm. militarily speaking, in my dark world and the dark world that I share with my colleague Brian, a fifth generation aircraft pilot is a special thing. Mm. And and if, if why pilot, just uh, for the for those of us who are uninitiated, just because uh, he knows so much about the technology, is he is is it does he have things to tell? Because the, uh, he can he can fly a machine that is smarter than average Washington D.C. think tank. Uh, he but, can. He, <laughs> <laughs> average, not the average think tank, but not not all. <laughs> not not, but, and but, average but, think tank because... but but what I what I mean is that is it okay? So 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 many 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 uh, hours and I'm I'm sure millions of dollars have gone into training this individual, but does he also know stuff that that's going to be extremely valuable to the Iranians exactly. and the Russians? He 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 comes with concepts of operations. He comes with mission briefings. He comes with rules of engagement. He comes with at least the details of his squadron. And this is not an ordinary squadron. We are talking about an F-35 squadron. 
We are talking about the details of the operation and everything. And imagine what, like, you are the best to go person here. Gilad Shalit, if I'm not mispronouncing his name, Gilad Shalit was a conscript in mm -hmm. the Israeli Defense Forces, ground forces, and he was not from Sayeret Matkal. He was not from the paratroopers. He was a conscript. And, and, and the capture of Gilad Shalit triggered a Middle Eastern security crisis and a, and a war following that. Now imagine it is not Gilad Shalit, and, a, it and it also and a hostage deal in which uh, in which over a thousand uh, uh, Ira uh, Israeli um, uh, prisoners, uh, uh, that is Hamas prisoners in Israeli jail, were released, including Yahya Sinwar, who runs Hamas right now. So imagine imagine it is not Gilad Shalit. Imagine this is an F thirty five pilot, and you are sitting in the shoes of the Iranian establishment. How would you negotiate? So this again, like this is Sukhoi 35 and underground underground bases. And what comes with Sukhoi 35? One last thing before I, I wrap it up and give the stage to, to Brian. At that level, like Sukhoi, Sukhoi 35 level, we are talking a system of systems with mission computers, very powerful radars. It has a PESA radar, passive electronic scan array radar, but it is it is still very powerful with missiles and all the systems and the Iranians are getting their hands into all these systems of systems, all the way from mission computers to radars to sensor systems and missile technology. So at that level, we are talking about something very sophisticated. Okay. Uh, so Brian, why don't you, uh, why don't you take us home? What are your, uh, do you have any, any reactions to anything John said, any thoughts about any of these issues and, um, uh, and we'll let you uh, finish out the conversation here. Uh, well, I agree totally with John. I think the um, some some of the takeaways be, would be as the Sukhoi 35 you know enters the Iranian fleet, um, it's going to be able to improve its ability to defend its territory, as John said, um, because you know the challenge that the Western powers will have in trying to stop or to uh, you know degrade the Iranian nuclear power program is that everything is buried in in Iran, everything of value, um, and you can't just attack it with a, a ballistic missile or a cruise missile. You've got to go in there with you know a heavy bunky bunker busting bunker busting bomb which has to be dropped by an airplane. So to be able to defeat these facilities, you have to go in with an airplane uh, and drop these very large weapons onto those facilities, which that's why the Sukhoi 35 is really important because now I can use that to defend my airspace it's got long range air to air missiles. It's got, you know, sophisticated uh, mission computers, as, as uh, John said, to be able to master the dog fighting. Um, and then beyond just the, the the airplanes and whatever weapons they get from the Russians, they'll also be able to take that technology and think about how they would reverse engineer it and apply it to other systems they build. So they could start thinking about, well, can I apply, put these some of these technologies into my next generation of drones? So I can take the, the seeker off of the Su-35's uh, air to air missiles, see, does that work in one of my drones? Drones, apply that technology and it sort of creates this flywheel effect where now Iran is able to field a, a new generation of more sophisticated systems that they can then sell to either Russia or China or whomever um, and other actors out there and then also give those to their proxies Hamas and, and the Houthis and Hezbollah who've all been using you know kind of new generations of Iranian technology in their most recent actions against Israel U.S. ships in the Red Sea uh, and also, um, you know, against Israel from uh, the north in Lebanon. So there's this flywheel effect that'll come from this technological transfer um, beyond what they're going to get in terms of being able to protect Iranian airspace and, and prevent, again, a uh, U.S. or Western uh, intervention uh, in its nuclear power program. And it could put, you know, Iran in the position of, you know, getting their nuclear power program up and running, getting, you know, ballistic missiles that can carry these weapons. And suddenly Iran is the biggest power in the Middle East. And I think we end up with then uh, something of an arms race uh, between them and Saudi Arabia very quickly. So the Su-35, I think, sometimes gets looked at in isolation as well. Isn't that cute? They're going to get some Su-35s to, but you know, to, that, to ramp up their air force. But it's much more than that. I'm a, so I worked in the Defense Department in in 2008, and I talked with the experts there about um, Iran's ballistic missile program because the Iranians were were um, were putting out these videos all the time claiming all kinds of spectacular tests and and uh with their with their missiles and the guys in the defense department i think correctly at the time but they would laugh at it and they first of all the the most of the videos were fake the iranians lied all the time 
and the the American experts on missiles at the time regarded the Iranian missile program as one big joke. Uh, and uh, uh, I can see, you know, the world has changed. Uh, uh, maybe maybe they should have taken it more seriously back then. I don't know. But certainly I think we can say now that in the last five or 10 years, we should have been taking it more seriously. And you can't look at these things in isolation and say, ah, oh, that's no problem for us. Yeah, I agree. I think you have to start looking at it as a whole. And I think the ecosystem that developed between Russia, Iran, China, and North Korea, you know, can't be underestimated. I mean, I think there's going to be a continued, not just support to one another, uh, but also innovation, you know, that's going to happen in there. And so the US and, and the NATO powers and, you know, Japan and, and other countries that have high tech military technology or high tech military systems, think of themselves as fighting differently than how these countries are fighting today might find themselves surprised you know when these countries are able to cobble together a battle network that is on par with what the us might have done um particularly when it comes to like air defenses uh and then you know long-range precision strike weapons okay so let's end this off with a quick fire question we'll start we'll start with you uh, uh with you brian and then john you you can take us home if you had uh the proverbial um, one minute uh, el elevator ride with the secretary of defense or the president. You want to give them some military advice about what the reality that we have just described here. Uh, Brian, what would it be? We've got to get minute. right. We've got to get uh, in on the ground floor on the, the future of drone warfare. I mean, that's fundamentally where warfare is going. It's going to be, you know, unmanned systems all the way from the dumbest loitering munition, you know, all the way up to the most sophisticated system that carries the loitering munition or or does the power projection operations. But that's fundamentally, you know, where a lot of these trends are driving. And we need to think about how that looks in a high end war fight, not just the Mad Max meets um, Star Wars kind of, you know, thing that we see going on in Ukraine or in, in Israel. This could be how the fight over Taiwan plays out. Um, and I think the DUD is trying to look at this, but you, they've, you, we've really got to embrace this model and say, this is actually the future of warfare. It's not the traditional platforms we see. Those are useful in deterrence and peacetime. But when it comes to actually fighting the fight, you might need an entirely different military than the one that you would use to posture like we see right now in the Middle East with aircraft carriers and uh, you know troops. We would need something entirely different if we were going to actually fight a war. Boy, this is uh, we get, with the, the 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 long time it takes to develop weapon systems and deploy them and everything. It's very difficult that with things moving so quickly to figure out what you should do today. John Kasapalu, you get one minute with the president. What are you going to tell him to do? Well, like one minute elevator pitch. I would say two things. Like first, you have to win the war in Ukraine because if you do not win the war in Ukraine, the 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 Siloviki elite hailing from the ranks of KGB will prevail in terms of their geopolitical worldview. And that political, that geopolitical worldview, sooner or later, will bring you to an Article 5 situation in Eastern Europe. And in that Article 5 situation, you will have a stark... Article 5 that situation that being when one of our NATO allies is attacked, we have to come to their assistance. One, one the very foundational basis of NATO, you're going to have a, 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 a decision, a dilemma between committing U.S. lives and troops on the line or losing a, a European security architecture that worked for decades following the Second World War. So before coming that, Ukraine is the last line of defense. And in Ukraine, you are not fighting the, the Russian military. You are fighting the KGB geopolitical worldview. You have to win that. You have to win that for, for, for preventing a U.S. boots on the ground situation. The second thing I would say, from the mid to the top floor, uh, the way you cope with the and you the way you address the Iranian drone proliferation and disruptive military systems proliferation, you cannot do that thinking in cold war understanding. Eighty percent of those weapon systems are benefiting from dual use commercially available systems. Your sanctions regimes would not work. Even your weapon systems designers would not understand totally how these systems are working. Even they are they are benefiting from Israel, let alone American. There are American components, Israeli components, Israeli commercially available components within within high end Israel high end Iranian solutions. You need a totally new understanding, new generation understanding of how to address that problem. A new okay. technology paradigm and a new technology philosophy. All right, gentlemen, thank you. I have learned a lot. I hope our viewers have too. Uh, thanks for your expertise and your time, and uh, I hope to see you again soon.